Hello again, Jules fans. Welcome back to the latest episode of Jules in the Blood TV. And with it, another episode of Jules in the Blood's Chats too. And as you can see, I have the pleasure up this evening of talking to former midfielder Danny Lloyd. Um, Danny That's played 34 games for the Jules in his time in Kent. He scored five goals and contributed two assists before, unfortunately, his spell was cut agonisingly short with that ACL injury that he suffered at Portman Road back in February 2022. That will be one of the subjects that comes up this evening, along with other stuff, his career as a whole. But obviously... It's a Gillingham-related channel, so predominantly we're going to talk about life in Kent. Dan, first of all, appreciate you taking out the time of your summer to come and have a chat with me, and uh, hope you're doing well. Yeah, thanks, mate. Appreciate you extending the invite to get me on. Uh, been a long time in the making, so uh, glad that we finally uh, got the chance to, to, have a, to have a chat. Yep, it has taken a while. You're correct, for one reason or another, which is, is totally understandable. The life of a pro is, is, is busy, especially at this time of year when everyone's trying to get themselves a club. Enough. We will get onto that later in the episode, <laughs> um, but we want to go right back to the beginning to start with because I don't want to just talk about Gillingham. You've had a career before that, mm -hmm. <laughs> not the career <laughs> I said I necessarily thought I was going to be reading about. So if if Wikipedia has not done me dirty, um, I didn't realise that you didn't get into the pro game until you was twenty five, which is, is is really late for a professional footballer. I mean, late, you don't yeah. you, you, you don't tend to see that at all anywhere now. Certainly not at the top end of the game. I'd imagine it probably happens more at our type of level without sounding disrespectful. But 25 is very, very late to have got in the pro game. Um, so I just want to ask, why? Was it was it personal choice? Was it finances that you had to take like another job or you had a good job or that type of thing? Or was it just a lack of opportunities? Um, probably a, a mixture of all of those things. Um without a little literally without giving you chapter and verse, it was mm -hmm. you know, I, I bounced about non-league. Doing the non-league circuit when I was younger, I didn't do a YTS or nothing. Um, I had like a, a family issue when I was only seventeen in relation to my brother, which is mm -hmm. widely talked about. I don't really want to go into that, but no, of course, um, it's on your Twitter bio, and I totally yeah, understand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, you know, if anyone <clears throat> does a, a modicum of research, they will understand exactly what went on, and there's mm -hmm. interviews about it where I've gone into more detail and stuff. But that's not what we're, we're trying to talk about. So, I bounced about in non-league. That happened, and sort of set me back a little bit, really, um, in terms of football. Gets back playing. He discovers the love of the game, starts playing again in non-league, um, goes through various different clubs and then settles a file for a few years. In reflection, I probably should have left filed after two years instead of staying the third one. Mm -hmm. um, and after that third year, obviously I was 24, 23, 24. I was working as a business development slash account manager. I was working way up. I'd gone like sort of up the levels reasonably quickly. Um and, yeah, football was just sort of not taking a back burner, but at the end of that season, I just said to me, me, me fiancé now, I said, I don't even know whether I can be bothered with this anymore. Um, I don't need it. It's it, it's adding stress to my life that I don't need. She was like, come on, let's just go on holiday and then make a decision afterwards. Right? Mm -hmm. And then literally about a week after the season finished, I got a phone call off Stockport, Jim Gannon. Just... Literally, I'd done a complete 180 in the space of a meeting with him and the club. Literally just was like, right, listen, I'm going to give this one last bash. And if I just stay on league, I stay on league. He said to me, fiance, listen, I'm going to give this one last go. Mm -hmm. And I, I want to say I was like, I don't want to say I was like the least dedicated because I was still training twice a week with Stockport and playing. I was still going to the gym. But I had work focus as well. That was really mm -hmm. grand. Problem. And... Um, it was. I would say it was like the least focused I'd been on football, whilst not sacrificing the the dedication to staying fit and being fit and being in good shape. And I literally just, I don't know whether that suited me best, not being super focused on football. And I literally just that season, I think I something stupid like twenty nine goals and twenty one assists in like forty six games or something throughout the space of all the competitions. Just went on a mad mad season. And then that took me to then be professional career at 25, signed for Peterborough on a three-year deal. Um, they once they got business done quick, I signed on the 8th of May. Mm -hmm. I had the pick of probably eight, eight, eight League Two clubs and a couple of League One clubs. Peterborough were always a constant in the last couple of the months of the season coming. So I think he watched me six times in the back end of the season. And we went there, 
first season in the league was like 13 goals and 9 assists did really well um, <clears throat> and for one reason or another we couldn't put our finger on it like my camp couldn't put my finger on it as to why at the end of that season after our did the message to us was we don't want him here Wrong. and that wasn't from the playing staff that was from the hierarchy of the club Um you know, you were just like, what? That doesn't make no sense. So I obviously had two years left on my contract. Mm -hmm. We had interest from, you know, a couple of teams in League One, League Two, and Salford were coming, coming and coming and coming on stronger and coming on stronger and coming on stronger. Spoke to them two or three times and, you know, we just, I'm always, I'm a people person, so I get energy and, and, and vibes off people and all ever football that ever wants is to feel wanted and mm-hmm. respected and that's Salford's I would say persistence and enthusiasm for me at that time coupled with the deal he gave me let's be completely real about it he gave me an absolutely ridiculous deal for mm-hmm. three years and I thank so him was this, this was at the start of would this have been just after the, the class of 92 had taken over? So this was... Yeah, the, the few, few years after he took over. It was their yeah. first year in the National League. So I'm sorry, um, that's what I meant. Yeah, it was the first time until it was the, like, yeah. the closest they got to the Football League since they, yeah. since they bankrolled it. And they basically were just saying, you know, we're having a right go. Mm-hmm. We've signed it. We've signed X, Y and Z. We want you. We want this player. Getting that player. And I just looked at a couple of the players that they were saying that they've got and they're getting. I was like, all these lags have like played in the league, like established league players. Like, I've only been in the league one year. Who am I to say no if these mm-hmm. lads are saying yeah? Anyway, the final sort of thing for me was um, <clears throat> I'd gone back and Steve Evans was the manager at Peterborough. Mm-hmm. And Steve was saying, I really like you, Dan. I want you to stay. Mm-hmm. Let me speak to the powers that be to see if we can sort out this issue. A couple of days, week goes by, pre-season yep. starts. Literally, there would, would there would be no new deal. I would stay on my deal for the remaining two years. Wouldn't get an, a new offer. Um, and they thought that it would be best for me to leave, so I left. Um, and I took the deal at Salford. Um, and that, you know, started off like an house on fire, dream. Mm-hmm. We, we had a little bit of a wobble early doors. But then we went, I think it was like 22 games unbeaten or something. Uh, we were just up against an incredible side in Leighton Orient that year as well. They obviously won the league by a few points, but they we literally would just go like Wrexham and Wrexham and Notts County, win for win for win for win for win. And we had a couple of really bad patches with injuries over the Christmas period and the New Year period, and it just proper stifled us. Um, we were having to, I think at one point we had one available central midfielder. You had me and a couple of other wild players having to play in central midfield and in midfield three, and it just didn't work. Of course. Um, and then towards the back end of that season, Alec Graham Alexander pulls me in and goes, listen, Dan, we're losing games, we're losing ground. He pulls me, a few of the other lads, like Runes, um, Nori Gaffney, Danny Whitehead, Matt, like lads who've been playing week in, week out, Tom Walker, and he goes, listen, I'm going to 3 5 two. I'm playing the most physical brand of football that I can possibly play to counteract what teams are trying to do to us. Mm-hmm. And they went on to win 10 of the next 11 games. <laughs> you do. So that's, that was dead unfortunate for me, but we ended up getting promoted, which was the goal as a collective. So well, I can't argue all... with it, can you, when it goes like I, that? No, not at all. I was super frustrated to be on the bench and, you know, occasionally be out the squad and, you know... It was a frustrating time. But then to to to, to I don't want to I say I don't want to give you chapter in verse, but that second season when we went in the league, mm-hmm. it was, you know, come back, we're gonna play three five two again. Doesn't necessarily suit you, but we're gonna play with the ten. Right, okay. okay. I I come back to that pre-season in probably the best shape I've ever been in football wise. I've I won every single fitness test. And when it got to the games, after the first three games of like playing 45s and then 60 60, I just got I got the I got the the vibe straight away that 
he just had a couple of other people who he wanted to play. And he was going to play a midfield three, not a two and a one. He was going to play a mm-hmm. one and a two with a, a, like a deep line CDM and two eight draw. Oh, so one Alden and two Orthodox rather yeah. than two Orthodox and then exactly. one third and a ten. Right. And for me, this this part of that by career was the, probably one of the most frustrating because I just felt like I didn't get a straight answer from anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, when I really, it could have just been, listen, this is the way we're going. doesn't suit you. You go and do what you need to do. We'll let you go out on loan. And if anything changes, we'll bring you back. But that didn't happen until the January. So that first half of the season... So this is, the, there, is this the COVID? This is the COVID season, the one that got cut short eventually. This is the lead up to the COVID season. Right, yeah. So I sat there for six months and literally, I think I, I think I made 10 appearances in the first half of the season. Something ridiculous like that. I'm just looking at uh, the stats for 1920 for Salford. So you only played, yeah, you only played nine times in, in League Two. And then yeah. you went and got a loan and played eight times in the second half of the season in the National League, yeah, which is so, ridiculous so, off of the, the two previous so, seasons. Made that first season in Salford, I finished on like something stupid, like 18 assists and four goals. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? So like, you know, if people look back, you look obviously on your stats and stuff, it only shows goals on like Wikipedia and stuff, doesn't show assists. But and the National League stats aren't, you know, you don't have them published anywhere. But I think I finished on like 18 assists and four or five goals. I've got 18 them. 19 here on a website, and the league alone was three goals and 10 assists in 30 games. That's just the league. So then obviously yeah. you'd have played other competitions as well. So yeah, so there, there is a website that does have both. I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but it does include. Yeah. So yeah. 13 goal contributions in 30 games. Yeah, in the league, in League 2, in the in the conference. Was that? Was that, yeah, that was the National yeah. League, the first yeah. season at Salford, yeah. Yeah, so then obviously there was like, you know, bits of cup games and stuff like that. Uh, yeah. And then the second season in League 2, can't even remember what we stats were, but they weren't, they weren't terrible considering only played nine games. I think I scored two or three goals maybe in those nine games for Salford that second it's season. Right, I yeah. can't remember off the top of my head. It's got two goals. There's nothing assist, no, nothing in terms of assist, but then I'm not sure if it's accurate. Yeah, yeah. and then you went to, to National League and scored once on your loan spell as well. But yeah. just so that that off is... the you just and shoot me down if I'm completely wrong. But it sounds like you, the way you're talking and the, the tone of your voice is like you've really had to battle for absolutely everything you've ever had in the professional game. That's what it yeah. sounds like to me. Just like every yeah. you seem to have had like setback after setback after setback, whether that's injury or a manager don't fancy or a change of system or. Yeah, just, just uh, every just critical like... point. Every critical point. There's just been something that goes. You, you're like, what, what, what's going on? What do I need to do? Um, Which leads me on to my next question because I've I've written down. You joined Peterborough in the summer of 2017, and since then you've played for. If I've got this wrong, you've had six clubs in six seasons. Yeah. <clears throat> and my question was, can you put your finger on why your career's been nomadic to a degree? Which is because you're averaging a club a year. Essentially. Yeah, no. I think, but I think, obviously, I think you've already answered that question. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that now coming into the, the lower leagues, the one year deals and stuff like yeah, that. I think you do see that very short term now. now, yeah. Oh, I can't, I literally cannot put my finger on why that is because the type of person and player that I am, if you mm-hmm. read anything that a manager's ever said about me or teammates or anything, it's I'm entertaining every day. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the fittest in the squad. Every single squad I've been in, always in one or two. So you've been, you only have to look at your Instagram account now, and you're not even got a club at the moment. And it's, it's literally yeah. just you every day out training with a personal trainer, one on one football coach, and stuff like that. So it's it cannot surely it can't be that you're not putting in the graph, not at all. No, I don't. I don't think I say it. Uh, you know, without without going into chapter and verse, it's you know we 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 fast forward that Salford. I don't really play. I make nine appearances in half a season. Most off, like a few off the bench. I don't even know how many starts that would have been in the nine. But um, I go to Stockport and I go back to Stockport. They get took over and I go back. They were still part time. So I was having to train in the day with Salford and then go and train again in the night with Stockport. They just got took over by Mark, who's done incredible things, mm-hmm. incredible things there. But I look back at those eight games and I wish I'd have never went because I wasn't ready. I wasn't fit. Right. Okay. In terms of in terms of matches. So I was fit in terms of I was training every day, but I wasn't playing games. Just in terms I, of game fitness, yeah, which is yeah. completely different. I don't think I completed the 90 minutes in those nine in those nine appearances. I don't know if I've got all them stats, but yeah, obviously half a season, there's more than eight games played, isn't there? So exactly. it tells its own story, of so course. So I go to Stockport and I look back and I say, 
it's it's a regret because of the way the clubs went now. And I always think back to go, well, if I wouldn't have went there in the January, would they have come back for me in the summer once they went properly full time and mm-hmm. I've had a, I would have had a proper crack at it to go back to a club that I love mm-hmm. and give it a proper, you know, have a pre-season and then and trying at the ground running with them. That's one thing that always sticks in me. That was a bit of a little bit of a regret that I jumped at the chance to go out on own when I was nowhere near match fit. And, you know, I, I scored scored against what we can I put into a decent performance, by the way, because I went into, like, not playing. And I think I went, un, up until COVID, I went, like, 90, 90, 90, or something stupid like that. I was absolutely destroyed. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It was, like, Saturday, Tuesday, National League. Um... I remember going to Hartlepool away the first game and just like I was on the pitch and I dropped down a level and people expect massive things. Obviously, Stockport were expecting to see the Danny Lloyd they had in mm-hmm. 2017 and I just wasn't match fit at all. Uh, and, you know, my granddad, bless him, he's watched me since I was a kid and I remember ringing him after one of the games and he was just like, he was like, Dan, this is not, you need oh, yeah. like, it's not, this is not you. Like, you, you're doing all right. You don't look out of place. But this is not the, the he version. Knows, he knows yeah. where you can be. Yeah. yeah. You just, you know. So anyway, that happens. COVID happens. Goes back to Stockport for that start of the third season. I mean, last year in my contract now. And finally, um, I had a chat with, with, with Graham at the time. He just said, listen, Dan, like, best for you to go out now. Like, best for you to, to leave. Mm-hmm. You're not going to get a chance. I was like, thanks. Appreciate that. Really do like really appreciate your your honesty and we didn't like, I didn't leave Salford on bad terms. I've spoke to Graham since Graham was actually one of the first people to message me after I got injured. Mm-hmm. Um, so man and Graham's personal relationship was absolutely fine. I think me and him had more chats than him and his wife <laughs> in that eighteen month period. <laughs> um, to be honest, but he always was he was always a really you know approachable manager, and we had some good conversations. I just then couldn't turn those conversations into actual performances, which was incredibly frustrating for me. Of course, yeah, especially um, when you want to repay the faith of someone who has yeah, so much in you. Yeah. Um, but, you know, our professional relationship just didn't really take off again after that first, like, eight months of my time at Salford. Uh, so I leave Salford. We end up, obviously, leaving via mutual consent. So that was in, like, the August. Again, I felt that could have been done a lot earlier to give me a chance of getting into a club. Yeah, you want a whole summer, don't you? To, to sort exactly. of your options, of course. You know, they took the whole of we took the whole of pre-season to get the you know the things sorted. Um, but yeah, and then goes into Tranmere again late, trying again, trying to you know integrate yourself into a group when you go in. It November is hard. You know, I signed a month deal initially, and then after a couple of games, we were like, we want to keep it till the end of the season again. I feel like I did more than enough to be offered something at the end of that season. Mm-hmm. Problem with Sam Mir was there was caretaker manager when I signed, Keith Hill took over, caretaker manager again by the end of the season. And I just like feel like I got bounced about between the managers. Again, yeah. what you what you do? I, I can't even again, I don't can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but I think, you know, I think I only scored one league goal, but I played a lot of me full matches in 20, the, this was what was this, twenty twenty one? I think so, yeah. Uh, three three goals, two assists in the league, four goals and an assist in the EFL trophy. So you ended up with seven goals and three assists, according to this website, from 39 games. Better, better than you thought. Better than I thought, yes. <laughs> 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 um, but the, my issue with Samia was when I played in the league, I was off at 60 minutes most of the time. Okay. That was a bugbear that I had. And then when I... So I, I wasn't, and mate, I'm as fit as a fiddle. Mm-hmm. I come on stronger in the late part of the games because my fitness has always been one of my biggest standout qualities. So I felt like when I was getting stronger, I, w- I was coming off or, you know, when I was on the bench, I was only getting given 10 and 15 minutes, um, which was a massive frustration, I think. And then obviously I was doing so well in the EFL. So we got to, we got to Wembley. I played at Wembley. We lost not only to Sunderland, I felt like I had a decent season at Sam, well, decent half a season at Sam, yeah. And then Mickey Mellon was taken over. Before Mickey could take over, all of the decisions were made on players. So again, it was just like, doesn't really make any sense, but whatever. Like, you must have been saying horribly in a past life, you, wouldn't you? 
I mean, how many I cats am, have I you am, run I'm, over? How many cats I'm, have you I'm, run I'm, over? Yeah. <laughs> In, in, a, in a past life, I was a despicable human being. Clearly. It must be, because I can't think of yeah. any other reason, because you seem lovely. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the end of that season comes to about, and you're just like, right, okay, listen, whatever, like, no problem. And again, no hard feelings towards hmm. the club or anyone at the club, love me time there. I, again, just got to that I didn't get to play in front of the, in front of the fans because it was coming the end of COVID um, and the fans weren't properly allowed back in yet. Um, that would have been brilliant for me as like a local lad to play. I was going to say, it's your neck of the woods as well, yeah. isn't it? So that would have been a year um, probably. It would have been amazing. But again, you know, I love my time at the club. There's some absolutely brilliant people at that club behind the scenes that I still stay in contact with now. Um, that, you know, when we played against Rochdale, you were, you know, big hugs and, you know, great to see you. And, you know, some absolutely like diamond people within that football club. And I really hope that, you know, they get it together and go and mount a challenge and get back to League One because that's a League One Oh, it's a massive football club at the level, yeah. Massive. Um, and then comes the Jills. Uh, Big Steve got on the phone. Weekends of pre-season. Uh, Lloyd, I'm honest to God, this is on my brother's life. I was stood up a ladder on the mm. side of me. I was putting expanding foam into the side of the wall because we'd just done drainage in the side of the wall. My phone goes, well, look, Steve Evans. I was like, how are you, Steve? You all right? He's like, can you get yourself to Gillingham tonight? This is half six in the night. You get yourself to Gillingham tonight, and I went for you, Steve. I'll get. I'll, I'll, I'll get have there. a go. I'll have a go. He's like, get there tonight. I've booked you an hotel premier in. Come and do a couple of days training, and we'll get something sorted. Mm-hmm. I went in on like a Sunday night or a Monday night or whatever. Comes in, does a bit of training, and he goes, "Yeah, you look, you look well, son. You look really fit. We'll get something sorted. Get something sorted, buzzing." Um, Did you sign? Pretty similar time to, to Aaron Chapman, didn't you? I think me and Chappie signed on the same day. It wasn't exactly the same day, I because I remember it being yeah, tweeted yeah. by a couple of like sites on on social media, and yeah. saying, "Oh, yeah. Shields have got two ex posh lads going in. Their fans should be happy with these." And yeah, I remember it being. Yeah. Oh yeah, so yeah, that would have been it. Would have been a double announcement almost. Yeah. So we we and then me and me and Chappie ended up living together, um, just down by uh, North House and South House Chatham something. I can't remember what it was. By the big ass dead in Gillingham, we lived. Oh, yeah. Uh, them, two, them two new blocks there. Lovely. Like, not really. Like, I was really like, you know, I lo- enjoyed my lifestyle down there. It was so difficult being away from me, me, my young family. But the the little group of lads that we had was brilliant. Mach and them lived in the opposite building. Yep. So that little four lads that we had, we just all, all close together, was brilliant. And we, you know, we had, you know, another good group of lads. Like the social stuff was brilliant within the squad. The the, the dressing room, we had loads of banter. Um, yeah, it was just, you know, the when I signed, I was made up to sign. I was jumping back to League One, a bit of like a, you know, prove myself again. Mm-hmm. Um, scores on my debut in pre-season. Away, oh, can't remember what the team was called. Uh, I remember they had, they had a red kit, though. I can't remember who it was against, but we played them with a header. It was Lincoln City. It wasn't. That was, that, was the, that was the... I'm talking the first game of pre-season here. Yeah. Oh, pre-season. Sorry, yeah, I thought you said first game. They had, they had a red kit. I'll tell you something. <laughs> I think we were two or three nil up before our time, and this, this kid just turned into Ronaldo and put two in the top corner. We were all like... Steve, oh, it must in. have been. A, it would have been a non-league side, I'd imagine. It was a non-league got... side, and this kid, this kid turned on the. On oh, the um, twice. It wasn't wasn't Ebb's fleet, was it? Nah, it wasn't Ebb's fleet. It was somewhere in towards London. This kid turned turned on on the edge of the box twice and stuck two in the top corner, winning two 0 and we all just looked around at each other, was going, "This isn't going to go well." And the other doesn't even ask that. Made Steve come in and went berserk. He went nuts. I was like, "Oh, what have I got myself in for here?" Um. Can I well, ask no. quickly, just to interject, what so, so you've turned up, like you said, you're excited because you're jumping back into League One. You had a decent season in League One with Posh before you dropped back into National League, League Two, that type of thing. So you know you can do it at the level. Yeah. You've seen us finish 10th the two previous seasons. Yeah. So you must have been thinking, I'm coming into a team here that's on the up, a club that's yeah. on the up. Surely we're going to be looking at, at worst case scenario, is around another top half finish. Mid-table, like at worst. At yeah. worst, I was coming in, you know, we spoke to Steve and he's like, listen, we're, we we play a functional brand of football. We play off the big man. I see you playing on the side of either midfield four, the side of a midfield four or off the big man. Yeah. 
Brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, we, still, we, still, we, still had, we still had really good players. Like V was there. Yeah. We still had Demps. We had Ollie Lee. Macca. There was Macca would, I think that, that was his second season. Unfortunately, he got injured, didn't he, very early on in the campaign. But yeah, there was uh, Tucker, Maxima still. Yeah. Two good keepers, didn't we? We had Chappie and then there was also the lad that came in from, from Chelsea, Jamie Cumming, who's gone on to do fairly well. He's brilliant. Felt sorry for Chappie, to be honest. Um, because Jamie I just, I just couldn't in. believe when he went to Stevenage because I thought... Chappie just going to go sit on the bench again. No, that's not for us to discuss, is it? That's... Oh, no, that is. Everyone has their own decisions. I think yeah. he's number one at Scunthorpe now, isn't he? I think, or somewhere back up home. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, mate, and we started the season with like a, a good 1 1 draw at home. Like, it was a battle and performance. They were decent, like, played nice football. But they got to the playoff final season before. Yeah. So, so decent like, point. Yeah. I was happy with that. Good, solid point to start the season. And I just remember, like, feeling. That we were always like we, I know we got a couple we got a couple of like couple of batterings. I I remember MK, MK Don slapped us at home because Stewie got sent off after about half hour. But we was yeah. I think we took the lead that day as well. V scored and we was we looked decent up until the two the red card and then obviously MK Dons were very good at the time. You can't play. It's hard to get the ball off them with eleven, let alone with ten for seventy five yeah. minutes. I feel like we we put in that season. Some really good 45 minute games. There's some really good 45 minute performances in that season. Mm-hmm. That if you could have extrapolated that over 80, 75, 80 minutes, you probably you stay up. It's just, I feel like, I feel like we weren't helped with the, the actual sad, the numbers of the squad. And we were thin. And once we got injuries, it showed. And didn't we miss loads of pre-season as well, Dan? Because there was a COVID outbreak. So we everyone missed, missed like weeks. two and a half, three weeks. of, in, And we missed, missed like four friendlies weeks. or something, didn't we, as well? Yeah, we missed two and a half weeks. Because V said it, was, it wasn't apparent at the time. Obviously, it was frustrating. But V said the longer the season went on, the more important that missed time seemed to prove because there was no yeah. relationships built on the pitch. Everyone was then essentially doing a pre-season in proper games. Yeah, um, I don't know really about the relationships on the pitch. I mean, V was V in terms of like obviously V's performance that season. He, he probably want look back and think he he, he wanted to score more goals. Of course. But I just think that the dynamic of the team had changed in terms of they didn't have a Jordan Graham who went down on the outside and didn't crosses him for him to go and yeah, you know attack. We were more of a we were direct off V, and when it went wide, they were wisdom. Mm-hmm. Wayne Stanley's to the back post. Um, or it was probably coming in from slightly deeper, so it's not a yeah. natural position for a centre forward to be heading it direct at goal. Maybe probably he's yeah. got to head it back across goal or have a touch first or something like yeah. that. I just I just feel like there was only a really... A t- we, we were only a settled team for me for about eight to ten games at, in that like end of August, September, October period. Mm-hmm. From when we... I think we beat Doncaster 1-0. Mm-hmm. And prior to that, we'd had some decent performances, if I can remember correctly. Please, more come at home, didn't we? I've written down, we only lost three out of our first ten in the league. There was five draws. So we was we weren't winning, guys, but it was hard to beat. Yeah. I think you scored the winner in that second win of the there was so I think it was played ten, one, two, drawn five, lost three. So it wasn't it wasn't a brilliant start, but it wasn't awful. We were we were, we were comfortably like mid table ish. Yeah, like... and again, considering the fact that we missed three weeks of pre season, yeah. essentially, it wasn't yeah. an awful start. And I remember the night at, at the Abbey Stadium when you ran from the halfway line, lashed one in the roof of the next. It was absolutely horrific. The weather was it? absolutely oh bashed it down all night. Yeah, and I thought, here we go, season can get going oh, now. So, so that was it. We beat Cambridge and didn't think we then we then like went to Bolton and we were two 0 up inside like fifteen minutes or something. Yeah. And I'm thinking, yeah. yeah. Here we go. We've got like it was Macher, Stu. Oh, who else played the midfield? It was me on the left, Macher on the right. Well, we went Macher, Stu, De- Macher, Stu, Demps, me, John, V. It was Robin McKenzie, Max, Jacks, and Dave, Jamie, in goal. And that's yes. that solid 4 4 2. And we had Dan said coming in as well. Um, yeah, he got injured just as he looked to be playing himself with a bit of form, broke yeah. his foot, didn't he? So yeah, I'm saying was... we, were, we, were, we were unlucky with like lads getting injured at critical times. We had, we what's his like... name, who's now at, the lad now at Burton, was always injured, but looked good when he, uh, Muzzy, Carriol. Yeah. 
I remember, I think it was Burton away, absolutely tore him a new one for, for 60 minutes. And then we didn't see him for two months, I don't think, after yeah. that he pulled hamstring or something. But yeah. Yeah, so beat Cambridge. And then we, we, then we, lost, we, we, lost, we lost four on the bounce after that, but we played Wigan, Ipswich, Wickham and Sunderland. I think Sund yeah. Sunderland was the... Was Sunderland, Sunderland, I scored the penalty at all. And yep. we, we lost decent. Yep. Um, Ipswich, was, Ipswich was just a non-contest. Wigan was a... I think Wigan, we lost 2-1. Or 2 0, but it was like dead home, late yeah. on. Dead yeah. late on. They scored two, if I remember correctly. Yeah, 64 and 82, yeah. Um, so we were in the game up until the 82nd minute. Yep. Um, and and then, like I say, beat Doncaster and then went to Bolton and picked up frustratingly in the end. The point, so you must be thinking, if yeah. you go to Bolton and you get off at a point before and you take it. Wasn't, yeah. And then obviously from Doncaster, we just, honestly, mate, it was. Just literally could not, could not put a performance together for love and the money. And I can't even say that it wasn't because the lads weren't trying or the lad we weren't working hard during the week when we were training. But the, the, like the lads were putting it in. Like I can't even say that we weren't. We were the lads were putting it in. Um, I just it just what it just didn't happen for us, and we just dropped and dropped and dropped and dropped, and we were just like, and once you're in that, what mate? It's it's so hard to mm -hmm. turn around uh, to, to 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 turn a group of men who were all going that way to turn them round is just like. But it wasn't even it, men, was it? During that stage, because I remember we had such an injury crisis that there was games where we had like literally four or five substitutes, and they were all kids. We played away at Cheltenham, right? Yep. And me and Reevesy, we started the game with five kids on the bench. And like a few of them playing, I I come off like with a with not like an injury, but like I was tight tight to the point where I couldn't carry on. Reeves, he come on within five minutes. He had to come off because he'd done his hamstring. And you just like we we were we were less than bare bones at some stages that that season. And was that's what the I said. Was this the FA Cup yeah. game? Yeah, because four uh, four substitutes. Gerald. Scored that great goal in at home to force the replay. Yeah, remember that game. Yeah, and um, this is what I said. This is what I said earlier about we were thin as a squad, thin. And you know, I, I know Steve and, and and Paul went back and forward about you know the budget wasn't great, and Paul was saying the budgets, you know, and this is the you know this was a mad thing. You had Steve saying one thing, Paul saying the other. Yeah, both vocally and in the press, it was just like it was just crazy. Um, you know. How much of a distraction is that? Does that does that affect the players, or do you just sort of decide just let them get on with it? And it's we'll not nothing to do with us. It's got nothing to do with us. But then you 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 you, you, you sometimes you look about and go, well, we have we've got kids on the bench. Like it is as he as he not good enough budget maybe like to bring more like two or three more experienced lads in. Because I remember you know, Steve playing Max Ema up front for forty five minutes in the League Cup right at the start of the season, and it was almost like we were in the like the Rainer men sitting looking at each other and going, is he? Is he just trying to prove a point to say we need we need more bodies? And then obviously yeah, the injury crisis got worse and worse. And I honestly, I, and, and again, like, look, do you know one game that like really stuck out for me? We played three five two away at Rodham, right? That's where we took the lead, wasn't it? After about a minute, we looked the first ten minutes. I was like, I was playing left wing back, and we were fizzing the ball out here. I was like, oh my god, wait, wait, look, we look good here. We scored, and we were like, mate, come on, let's go. And Max gets injured, does, does his shoulder. Yeah, like, dislocated his shoulder, didn't he? Well, here we go, like, come on, what is going on here? And then we got B5-1. Like, yeah. And that was even, the bench that night was even worse than the worst. That's not the wrong word. Sorry, that's disrespectful because they're kids, so I shouldn't be using that word. But it was... There was no senior person on the bench. Tommy Crump, because I think Jamie Cumming had COVID, so Jappy started. So Ch Tommy Crump was the subkeeper. Harvey Lintock came on after 11 minutes for Max. Bailey Akers come on after 70 and Gerald came on after 45 because John Akindi must have on, must have pulled John up Akindi injured. got injured, yeah. So you start the game with a good solid 11. Yeah, All the 11 is absolutely fine, yeah. Absolutely sound. But we did yeah. miss, we missed Demps and Oliver, didn't we, for loads of that run. I think they got injured. Well, yeah, they, they both went down at the same time. I think they were yeah. out for eight to ten weeks to, together. Yeah. Which was frustrating. Obviously, you take them two off the team, and they're two big lads in the team. You know, our whole game was based off it and it and V and John together. When we had that settled four four two at the start of the season, 
Aiton V and John, they were a day, mate, they're a handful on for any for the best of anyone. And I just I just always look back and think if we could have maybe kept that 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 eleven or like fourteen together for the rest of the season, no way we'd have got relegated, we'd have picked up results. Yeah, because Steve, even the season when we finished 10th, didn't use loads of people. I think it was like 14 or 15 that was the, yeah. the go-tos all the time. And it probably cost us in the end in terms of the playoffs, that that COVID season behind closed doors, the running it, re- leading up to the summer where you yeah. came on board. But he trusted them and, and they did a job and they all knew their job. So you can understand why it was being done. But That's Steve Evans, mate. If you look at Steve Evans' teams, it's always... you know Even Steve in his last season, I think he only had 18, 19. Yeah, it's the same players all the time. People who we can trust to do a job. Right, so we've got through this run that's essentially gone from mid-October to February the 1st. So in that time, we've lost a lot more football matches, unfortunately. I think it was New Year we went to MK Don's, got a brilliant nil-nil. If I remember, Jamie Cumming was was brilliant that afternoon. Yeah. And I, again... And, and I, I think... and we, we, were, I, I, we, we drove to that game. Hmm. Um, and we were on the way back and we were thinking... Okay, we've turned the corner here. That's a solid, solid point. I think Don't Steve think... came out in the press and said, if we get everyone back fit, we'd be absolutely fine. And everyone was like, right, relax, chill out, got half a season, we're going to be all right. Yeah. And we all thought we were going to be all right. We're like, no way, we can get relegated once everyone's back fit. Mm-hmm. And we just did never get everyone back fit, ever. No, because it always seemed that one or two came back, yet another two then broke down. Yeah. And... Two come back, two go out. One comes back, one goes out. And you're like, what the hell is going on here without being, you know, using expletives like, you know what I mean? Of course, yeah. And by the time we did win another game, obviously, Steve had gone. Yeah. I want to ask you, and sorry to put you on the spot because this wasn't in the notes that I sent you, but just from a football perspective, it looked like Steve had probably taken us as far as he could, didn't want to be there, however you want to label it. Was it the right call to, to, to take Steve out of it? I'm not saying that the, the process afterwards was entirely correct because it seemed to take a long time. We wasted an entire transfer window before making a permanent appointment. Yeah. But was it the right call to let Steve go elsewhere? Because just just for a change of scenery, just for a change of voice or a change of approach or anything like that, do you think it was the correct decision? I know hindsight's a wonderful thing. Hindsight, yeah, hindsight's a great thing. And obviously Neil come to the club. Mm-hmm. That was an incredible appointment for the state, for the way the club was at at the time. Like, oh, absolutely! Fair, like, fair play to everyone involved. Like, that was a top appointment at the time, considering the position we were in. Um, because he didn't have to take the job. There was no need for Neil to take the job at no, all. We said that because he's coming in. He's essentially writing a, a relegation on his CV. That's um, what everyone thought when he turned turned up. But at the time of maybe Sachin and Steve, did did the club have Neil as an option? I don't know and I can't say. So whether it was the right thing to do at the time in terms of results, if you look at the results as black and white, you probably say, well, yeah, the results haven't been good mm-hmm. enough. Sack the manager based on results. Great. Okay. Yeah, we're not one for three months. So yeah. something's got to give. Something's got to go. Based on Steve and Paul's potential working relationship, again, can't speak for what what, what state that was in, whether it, whether it was bad, indifferent. I don't know because I weren't involved in any of the conversations. But, that could have been a factor. Um, so you, you can't even look at it and go, well, after Steve goes, results then pick up. Or, you know, we get that new manager bounce. Because I don't I can't remember where I don't, I don't think we did. I did. I don't think they did in terms of the, the interim period, unfortunately, because yeah. when we're going to have to talk about it. I've spoken to Stuart about it. I've spoken to V about it. And I've spoken to, to Carl Dempsey about it. So I'm going to ask you because... I think I made the point of replying to you or retweeting because I said at the time you was the only person after Oxford that came out and actually said something publicly and said something along the lines of, and I'm not, don't quote me, but that was an embarrassment. This isn't good enough. We've all got to look at ourselves and we've all got to be better, that type of thing. And I, and I said credit you at the time. And I understand that some players don't like to come out because they just want to almost, it's almost like if you go back 20 years, don't read the newspapers. Now it's don't look at Twitter. And I understand that, but I just felt there should have been more coming from the players after, because it's not just getting beat, that was an absolute abomination of an afternoon, and I've said it's one of my worst afternoons watching our football club, and I've been going since the 90, early 1990s, and it was it was almost like you've got to laugh, otherwise you cry, because it was it was just that bad. Well, listen, there was no laughing going on in the dressing room after the game, like, and all the oh, days that in, in the days that took over, like nobody enjoyed that. The lads on the pitch didn't enjoy it. The lads on the the lads at the club didn't enjoy that period 
I can wholeheartedly say that that was a very difficult period to be mm-hmm. a player of the club as well. Not and you know I can imagine, you know, for 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 Steve coming into the BD interim boss wasn't a great experience for him either. No, um, coming into a group of lads who were down on the luck, down on the confidence. Trana, he's been out the game a long time. You know we had a packed up staff and squad. Um, it was a difficult time. It really was. Um, but that day in particular, I just felt like after the game that I am always very interactive with fans, always like to to um, not give me opinion, but, you know, put myself out there for, you know, to, mm-hmm. to take the criticism when it's bad and take, you know, you, you take the good with the good with the bad. That's um, it. And that's always my point. If you win 7-2, all the fans are going to be going, oh, bloody hell, what a performance. So you then have to be big enough to take it when it goes course. the other way. And I've always done that. Always mm-hmm. done that. Like, I don't mind taking a bit of stick, a bit of banter or whatever, but I just felt like after a performance like that, I was one of the older players. I wouldn't say I was a senior player within the dressing room, but I was one of the older players. Mm-hmm. There's lads that have been there longer and been, you know, a bit, a bit older or whatever. Uh, but I just felt like I knew... I was probably the most active on social media out of all the lads. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, I, I, someone's got to say something. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, it was an unacceptable afternoon on every level. Um, you to concede seven at home just should never happen. I know it does happen. You know, there's teams like, you know, Southampton, you conceded nine at all. It, but that's just, it's just unacceptable. It shouldn't happen. But afternoons like that happen in football. Oh, yeah, never totally happens. understand that. You know what I mean? It never happens when your club's flying high. It's always a kick in the nuts. That's just mm-hmm. football the way it is. It's horrible. Um, it can be. It can lead you to the point of despair and desperation, and just like you know, you get home and you want to put your head in the pillar and just be like scream. Mm-hmm. As a player, manager, coach, fan, what it, you you take it takes you to like the the point of like why why am I doing this to myself? But mm-hmm. then. You, you know, yeah, I felt like that a few times during that season. Yeah. I won't lie to you. Yeah. I mean, I convinced myself we were relegated about four times. I convinced myself that we might stay up Fair a enough. couple of times after yeah. Neil came in. It was, it was, yeah, it was one hell of a, a roller coaster think of emotions. Once Neil come in, even once I'd got injured, I did think we'd stay up. Mm-hmm. I really did. I think there was, I think we drew, we drew at home to Wimbledon and Fleetwood. There's one other game as well, because I know people sort of look at the games later on in the season. The, the Fleetwood one was obviously the massive one Easter weekend, and then there was being in front twice at Cheltenham as well and not holding out. But I think you was the width of a crossbar away from winning it for us under Steve Lovell against Shrewsbury, weren't you, with a free kick in front of the rain? I mean, remember that? Jesus Christ, it was about 40 yards out. Dad, and we just it was the absolutely width, miles width out. And I thought, yeah. we was all looking at it and I think he, he can't shoot. He can't. Are we? Are we? Uh, oh, it's hit the crossbar. Yeah, no, it was it literally like the width of a post. Yeah. Width of a post, and it just it kissed the right. If it kisses the inside, it just kept going. It just glanced yeah. as it went out. Yeah, it, it, it just wobbled in the air a little bit too much. That's all. In. Yeah. Um. So, yeah, of frustrating. But you know, if we if we go back to you know when Neil gets appointed, I think I said it in the press. It was the most impressive managerial change that I'd ever been a part of. Yeah. We we couldn't believe it as a, as a fan base, like you've said, because of where we were and the state of the club and what we was hearing in the press yeah. and that type of thing. You think, why is this bloke who's come out of the championship 12 months ago want to go into a team that's essentially getting relegated into the basement division? Yeah, that, um, that fit, especially the first 48 hours, the structure, the behind the scenes organisation, the clarity and delivery of information and standards and expectations and I was like proper, like I'm. You've got me by the plums here. Like I'm all in. Let like let's go. Yeah. And I, you know, a couple of games before, even like toward like you know a couple of games before, I felt like my performances were picking up. I felt like I was. I felt like I played well for Gillingham on the whole mm-hmm. in a in a in a difficult period. But the two games before and in the two games under Neil and one and a half. The crew game, I feel like it's one of my best games. I felt like I was involved in everything good we did. Probably could have had a couple from open play. That was the night we we played a we had to play. V didn't play that night, did he? 
Now we played me, Muzzy, and Charlie Kellum up front. That's it. And it was almost like a 3 4 Four, 2 three, 1. Three. And yeah. Winfrey absolutely terrorised them for the first 45 minutes. And again, Muzzy unfortunately got injured and had to come off at half time. Again, like, so here's where, here's where my football head comes into it. Um, and I go, if we win that game, Muzzy doesn't get injured. Does that then 11 start the next game away at Ipswich? Even though we played well for 65 minutes at Ipswich until I got injured and then we scored straight after. Um, and then I think, well, would the same team have started, which maybe would have... We, it was because it was a completely different dynamic to the way we ever played all of that season. Because we were always reasonably direct into V. Because you got because you got you yeah. can see V there, so your tendency is to hit him fairly early. Yeah, of course. Yeah, v, V's now no longer there. Mm -hmm. So you've now got a very dynamic front three, and as you said, we completely ran the first 45, 60 minutes against Crew. Mm -hmm. Should have been more than one nil up. We go in. I think it was in the first half, wasn't it? We scored. Yeah, it was because it was in the the no, the no. Yeah, you scored down the brought yeah, down the opening. The end. Yeah, and then um. Was he gets injured? Fucking again, just what hours you look. But then we um we see the game out, no problem. Everyone's buzzing, takes what and it's honestly, it literally takes one win to just do a complete 180 of mm. mentality, and everyone's like, We're gonna be we're gonna be sound, no mm. problem. Muzzy gets injured, go to Ipswich, and arguably they had the lion's share of the possession, we had the better chances. In that game, you hit the crossbar. I think close up. You sort of deflected the off the defender. And I was having a good game. Yeah, but you personally hit the post. I think V hit the post. And I hit the bar just before I got injured. Yes, you did, and we absolutely bashed them for forty-five minutes. Well, forty-five minutes. We come in at half time, and I think I remember Neil going, "I've got next to nothing to say. Just can't do the same. Perfect. Do do what you've just done again, and you'll win the game." And Ipswich were, were, were at a good side. If they're basically the same side, that's just got promoted. Yeah, there's a lot in there that you'd say. With a couple of additions, right? So we're all sat there at half time thinking, right, lads, come ahead, let's do it. And we go up the second half, and he, I think they pinned us about five or ten minutes in the lead up. No, they never. They never. No, I don't think they did. Don't think, no, we, we started the second half well because I remember a move where I had, a, I had the ball. Because you were at the bar start of the second half before yeah, you went off. I yeah, I had the ball in our defensive half on the left hand side. We wriggled free, played the one two with Stu. Stu's turned and clipped one over to be right at the start of the second half. I'll never forget it. So I thought, we're going we're to win soon, Leah. I knew it. We were creating chances. V's gone over the top. It one just dragged it wide. But I've then gone up that end. That's the one that hit the post. Yeah, little scramble. Yep. I've, I've then smashed it against the bar and it's gone out for the corner yep. of the kid. It's hit the kid on the back of the bum, hit the bar. I'm like, we're no problem here, brilliant. And they then get a corner. And then this is where we go into like, you know, sort of heartbreak territory for me because mm -hmm. up until that point, I've never had a serious injury in football. I've never had a muscular injury. It's always bones, bangs, dead legs, nothing major. Yeah. Corner goes up. I'm up on the halfway line with Wolfenden. Heads out. Goes back in. Ollie puts his foot on it. Mm -hmm. From on the left hand side of the halfway yeah, line. Because you was towards you was the side where we all were sat as Jules fans. Clears the ball out towards you. Yep. And yep. I'm running towards you now. And as 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 we both started to run, I've give Wolfenden a nudge to put him. So I'm then running across the halfway line to drag mm -hmm. the ball towards goal. And as I've dragged the ball, um, as I've dragged the ball, I've put my leg across him to flick it. And I've I've opened, so as I'm as I'm here, I've opened my foot this way. Mm -hmm. And he's then he's then like lunged in from the back and like scissored my leg that way. And then yeah, that's it was just horrific, just instant. In in I've never obviously never been shot, but I just felt like I'd been shot in the back of the knee. Mm -hmm. I just it, so the only the, the the feeling that I described to the, the consultant when I went to see him is if you put two hands on a Rubik's Cube and just went, poof, that's what it felt like. Crack, punch, pop. I remember rolling around and the ref just played on the new free kick. For ages. For ages and ages, yeah. He'll, 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 he'll have to run onto the pitch to stop the game. 
I was screaming in pain, like yeah, because like I said, he was right in front of us, and we were sat there, and I said to the bloke next to me, I said, "That's that's bad. That's a bad one." Like because that's like you've said, if you was if it was just something minor, you'd get up and you'd carry on. Yeah, but no, but listen, I'm, 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 that's I'm, the I'm, why you didn't game. move at all. I am all my hands up. I play the game, no problem. Um, gamesmanship's big part of the game. I will fully play the game to benefit my team, no problem. But I get up. Yeah, have a little bit of a roll around, have a little look. You get up. If you're not not on seriously, you get up. Um, and I remember being on this side and looking at the Ipswich fans, and I'm like just screaming. And I knew it must have looked bad because all the Ipswich fans on the side of the pitch are like this, like yeah. stop the game. And I just remember she started crying on the pitch when Tom came on because I was just like, that's me done. Like, I thought that was me done, like, for good. Because I knew I looked down at my leg. And I was just, you could, honestly, it started swelling up before I got off the pitch. Yeah, it was hard. Yeah, and, then, and then you get into the dressing room. And your legs in your legs in the splint and they put an ice on it. And literally I remember just like after the bar, the fella the fella come in and did the medical Ipswich medical department were incredible with me, like mm-hmm. he was so good. Said that at the time. And I remember the fella doing the the the, the, te- the test where like he pulled he, so if your knee goes like this, you there's no ACL left, it's gone. <laughs> and he, he does me leg and my leg just went. And he just looked at him and he just looked at me and I was just like, and he just shook his head and I was like, and then he went, he went, he went to test me MCL as well. And I literally, I nearly, I nearly hit the ceiling when he started to pick me, when he started to pick me leg up to do the, the MCL, it, like the test where he go like yep. that. And then I'm like, so my ACL's gone, my MCL's gone. And then I just remember being sat there on my own because everyone had left. I'm sat there on my own. My phone's going nuts. I'm just looking at my phone. My partner's trying to ring me. I've got family messaging in the group. Have you seen it? I'm just like, I'm done. Like, this is me. Like, as so you bad genuinely as thought that might be it in terms of a yeah, professional career? Like, yeah. Obviously, there's in the back of your head, just being silly, you're emotional. Like, and you're just playing Jekyll and Hyde with your head. Mm-hmm. And that was the Saturday. <clears throat> I go see the consultant on the Monday morning. But by this point, Matt, my my leg was like the fucking elephant, man, mate. It was ridiculous. And obviously, I posted videos where there's a picture of when I went for the MRI, and literally my leg is it's like. Huge, yeah. And I remember getting, I remember getting up on the Sunday morning after the game, <clears throat> and like sort of like getting myself out of bed. And I remember looking. So from my knee down, imagine this is my knee. I, I spent and stood up and me me let me knee from the lead down just went side to side like that. And I was just like, I remember I ran me me, me fiance and was just like, this is really bad. Like yeah. really bad. Yeah, I remember <laughs> doing mine and I and I tried to get up and walk on it because I'm the same. I was like, I'll be all right, trying to ice it. And it but it just felt like the top the bottom part of your leg's not attached to the top part of your leg. That's literally what it felt like. There was just nothing in between to hold, like from the thigh to the middle and the middle down. There was nothing holding anything together. So, so we see the consultants, Dr. Ball, in the 40th surgery in London, and we got in to see the best people, like mm-hmm. the best people. Um, and Gillingham as a club, obviously, through the insurance, I literally... Got me in with one of the top, top guys. Like, literally, to look at me now, front on, you would not even know I've had my knee done because the scar is so neat. So he goes in and he sent... So he goes into Kim's, I think it was, in Seven Oaks to get the MRI and then they send it over to... When we went to see the, the consultants. The MRI was Monday, go see the consultants on the Tuesday, I think it was, or Wednesday. Mm-hmm. And... In the consultant's words, he just said, "I you need to prepare yourself for this." He was like, "It's like it's like you've let a bomb off in the middle of your knee," and I went, "Why?" He was like, "So my diagnosis is a full thickness tear of your ACL, a near enough full thickness tear of your MCL, a grade one tear of your PCL, 
and you've potentially also torn your lateral meniscus as well. And you've got other bits and bobs. You've got bruising, bone bruising, like the top of your calf is fucking as well. Like just, I remember just looking at Gaz and Gaz is looking at me <laughs> and Gaz is, Gaz is the most tanned individual in the world with the colour drained from his face. And I was just like, and the doctor ball in the meeting went, you will make a full recovery. And I was just like, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> like it's so, it's so far away in that That's room the thing, in the head. It? You almost it's need someone so to say you can far do away. it. But got the doctor going. It's miles in front of where you are at that stage. And I know this is February now, mm -hmm. and I've got no contract from June that year. And the doctor going to me. 18 months to two years. And I'm like, what? He was going, yeah, it's 18 months to two years, like, for you to be back to where you are now, like, where you were on Saturday. And I was just like, doc, I haven't got that time. If I, I said, can I get back from this? He went, yeah. I said, is there a avenue where I don't play again? He went, yeah. So I was like, I was just, honestly, mate, I was like, Distraught because of that, say, I come into the game late, and I was like, again, what have I done in the previous life to deserve mm. this? Yet another setback when I'm just getting, I'm just getting going. I'm, I'm ready to see the best version of myself. I'm match fit. I'm fit, like, and then just yeah, again, again, I must have been a despicable human being in a previous life. Um, so. Obviously, I'm then never seen again in a Gillingham shirt, which is massively frustrating. Yeah, but... it was. And we've spoken about this as fans, and I've spoken to it about you, with you on Twitter, and we've said, and, and I've said to you a few times, not just to blow smoke up your ass, but I think a Gillingham side with Danny Lloyd did it in that last two months of the season, finds another goal, finds another point. Another point. One point. One million percent. Whether that's you know, a decent corner at home to Fleetwood or a winner at Cheltenham or... Yeah. We see a draw somewhere else, which makes the difference. Yeah. And that's, like I say, I'm not doing it just to blow smoke up your ass. I just think that the, the lines were that fine at the end. The momentum that we gained with Neil as well, I think you'd have thrived on that. Yeah. I think if I don't get injured, I think we stay up and I'm still at the club. Now. Probably, yeah. I think I'd have probably got a good deal in the summer. And then, obviously, you know, the takeover happens and... You know, I would like to think I would have went from strength to st strength to strength that summer. So I would have, even if I would have, would have got another one year, I'd have been playing under Neil the exact same way I was playing when he mm -hmm. took over. And you know, the takeover happens, and then this season, you know, we we might have you know got something permanent, more permanent done. Um, but in terms of you know my time in in Kent. I had a I had a decent lifestyle down there, as I said. Like I enjoyed it. It was difficult being away from the family. I had a young family. My missus was like, you know, she was just like a machine uh, with the baby on her own. She did so well. Uh, with me, we see we see little running around at a few away games. Yeah, he's um yeah he's just like a little mini clone of me. Uh, <laughs> loads of energy. Doesn't ever. Got two, good knees. got two good knees. Got two. I've got two good knees now. Well, maybe one point like eight, maybe. But yeah, that's yeah, what I always say now. I'm like one and three two good knees. Yeah, got two good knees again now. He's got he's got two good knees, solid ones. So, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, obviously, you know, I was fully supported behind the lads the whole time I was injured while I was cracking on with rehab. I had to wait seven and a half weeks for the op. Um, you know, I literally I lived and breathed that rehab because I knew. I needed to defy all possible recovery times. To, so, to they get said, so they've said to you 12 to 18, no, 18 months to two years. 12, 12. He was, he, the doctor was saying 12 months to get back to seeing him, potentially. And you, took, and you played your first game about 11 months after the injury. Seven and a half months, yeah. I was saying after seven and a half months. So what's what's the surgeon said to you? I imagine he's probably as he he must be amazed, but he's probably told you off as well, surely. He couldn't really because my strength markers were all there. So again, without going to chapter and verse, an ACL injury just isn't your ACL injury, as you well no. know. So I do me six weeks of uh, pre-op. I then go into the op, and the operation is I had a bone patella bone graft where 
you go into the op and they actually injure you again because they, 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 they cut out a nine and a half mil strip of your patella tendon. So it's which different for us at our Sunday yeah. league colours. It's different because mine was done with my hamstring. Hamstring graft. So yeah. the hamstring aloe graft is a more flexible, uh, mm. a more flexible graft. So it's meant to be better for your like sort of long term. Whereas mm. obviously for, for an athlete, they need the strongest possible, strongest possible graft. But for a shorter period of time, I'd for imagine. A shorter period of time, yeah. and then you can go back and get your hamstring took out when you finish playing because no one bothers about that. Then like you finished. Um. So that happened to me six weeks, seven and seven weeks after. Um. Again, when we when we finish, I'll, I'll do it. quite a funny story about after the operation when I broke up and I was like, I don't know all the drugs, but we won't go into that on 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 on, on air. It's funny, but I'll tell you after we finish. Um, and uh, you know now you said that I'm going to get about a million Twitter messages going. What did Daddy tell you afterwards? Yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, get to the op. Op goes like incredibly well not that I can remember anything of what the surgeon said to me after the op because as a guys again I was high as a kite but Gaz did fill me in said it couldn't have gone any longer but I was I was under for about three hours the operation didn't meant to be like and I was just over an hour but apparently my knee capsule is incredibly small and my ligaments around were very big so it sort of explains why I've never had really had any problems with my knees before because the actual size of my knee joints really small but then the ligaments around it were really big and strong so it's protected so, more, right, okay. So I went into the operation and I literally, given all of the damage to the ACL, the MCL, the PCL, the lateral meniscus, I literally just had an ACL operation in the end because my MCL had healed itself in seven weeks, solid. The PCL had healed itself, solid. And the lateral meniscus tear was that small in the end. There was no point in touching it. And touch wood, I've had absolutely not a problem since I've come back playing at Rochdale. I didn't have one muscular injury. The odd little, like, I was tired and stiff when I come back, obviously. Of course, yeah, that's naturally just been um, played for so long. But in terms of, like, any muscle tears against touch wood, I had not a thing. And I played 16 consecutive games, 23, 24 appearances, just under 2,000 minutes. But we'll get on to that in a minute. So... I get the op, I does four weeks of rehab with the club. Mm -hmm. And then obviously was told that I was having to be placed on the release list, but they were still going to be trying to do something. Neil spoke vocally a couple of times after the end of the season, saying we're trying mm -hmm. to get something with Danny. And there was conversations had about we're trying to do something, what that looks like, we don't know. And it just didn't ever happen. So for me personally, I was upset because mm -hmm. I enjoyed being, I wanted to have a club to do my rehab. Mm -hmm. Of course. Now, looking back in hindsight, I don't think I'd have got back as quick as I did if I'd have been in the club because guys would have had a leash on me like with two hands like this just holding me back so it's almost in a weird way you had a benefit because you had no one keeping an eye on you as much so you probably did a bit more than you should have been doing at certain stages potentially potentially but then you what it was so with obviously you know the loss of my brother when I was younger mm -hmm. that period of getting fit from week four post-op to when I returned playing was probably the most testing time of my life and my young family's life because I didn't have a club. Mm -hmm. Didn't get paid after July mm -hmm. until end of January, really. I got two weeks wages off Rochdale mm -hmm. uh, the end of December. Um, and that went great because I was only on a month deal initially. <laughs> so, you know, we yeah, wages... Actually, very short-term money because you only saw until the end of the January. Wages actually until I signed the, the, the extension. Mm -hmm. uh, afterwards so for the for, for best part of six seven months we I had we were down to one income and you know off savings and stuff like that and you know didn't have haven't had a, a long amazing career financially so I had what the one deal at Salford which was financially beneficial for mm -hmm. me and my family um, but it was incredibly challenging physically and mentally because you, you Going to a, I was going to a David Lloyd gym, mm -hmm. 
on my own six days a week. That's it. And I suppose then it's there are probably days, and you can tell me if I'm wrong again, where you probably don't want to get out of bed and go and do it, but you've got to force yourself to do it because you know that you've got bills to pay and you've got a partner yep. and a, a little one to support. And you, so you've, you've got no choice, essentially, as much as you don't want to do it. It's not that it's not that you don't want to do it because you know you have to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just you're tired physically because you, you know your muscles have wasted away. Like yep. when you can't contract your muscle, they disappear at a rate of knots that like you don't oh, yeah. even realize. A lot quicker than, it, lot quicker than yeah. it takes to get them back. Yeah. Um. It's 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 honestly soul destroying, and I know everybody that I've spoke to in the game the recovery from that injury is just like you wouldn't you wouldn't wish it on the the papers if you think of the, the the person in the world that you dislike the most that you've ever met you I would not wish that on that person mm -hmm. I wouldn't because it's horrendous and to have to do it on my own mm -hmm. in a in a normal gym that's not a that's not hasn't got all the necessary equipment you need I've had to buy like you know I was dead lucky that a friend uh, that a friend I'd met at Peterborough Lent me his game ready machine, right? Because the club only had one, <laughs> so <laughs> I had my own I, I, at the time. So, mm -hmm. like, obviously, the lads that needed that for after games and stuff. So, if I wouldn't have had the get, I'd have had to rent one like 100 quid a week to rent. So, he'd done me a touch, but I, I had to buy a complex. I was having to buy my own resistance bands, my own slide plates, like my own. Um, honestly, the, the bag of gear that I used to take into that gym was crazy. I obviously I was going every day. So like I was getting, you know, the same people seeing me the same. I used to I was like regimented. I'd get up at the same time. I'd be in that gym for between half nine and ten o'clock every mm -hmm. single day. And I'd have to do a session in the morning. I'd have a drink, something to eat, and a session okay. again in the afternoon. And then I'd go and pick the baby up or come home and, you know, be, you know, the the man of the ocean, whatever else that entails and go in the shops and, you know, Getting me over and me mop out and me married all done because you know my missus was in work and that was the way it was for That's that period of time. Exactly. It's, this so, is, and I think this is what people tend to forget when you talk to a professional footballer. It's not all. Think the same this, like, super, is, people think you've got this like superstar lifestyle. It's not. It's not the same as it is in the Premier League, is it? Unfortunately, it's completely different, and um, that's what I think yeah. people tend to sort of forget quite a lot of the time. Unfortunately. Yeah. So anyway, you know, people track me journey all the way along, and you know, I, I literally I put. Every single ounce of me and my being into that rehab to get back. So I knew I needed to get back. So I knew there was no other option for me. What I wanted to do, I wanted to get back and prove again that I was back, that I could do it and I could play at the level. So I goes into. I think it was like I don't want to go into like loads. So like you have to hit certain strength markers at certain points in your rehab in mm -hmm. order to go to the next stage. Smashed every single one every time. Gets back, ready, signed off. Started running at 16 weeks, which is what you're meant to do. Gets me strength back up to within 10% deficit. So you, you train single leg. You test your right leg, the uninjured one, and then you've got mm -hmm. to get your quad and your hamstring and all your muscles within 10% deficit of strength and power before you get signed off to go back and train. That happened after like seven months and one week, or two weeks. I then goes into Burton. Uh, Burton offered me the chance to just go and do a bit of training. And you know, we'll see what happens. It was not unpromised. I just needed to go in somewhere. Wasn't there to... something that went round on social media at the time that there was a picture of you got caught with a pair of there was a photograph that went round of you in training where at Burton? I'm sure there was, and everyone yeah, put yeah. two and two together and came up with about 74. 74, yeah. As they always <laughs> do, it's football Twitter great, isn't it? Um, <laughs> so went into Burton and I had two boss weeks down there. I I I enjoyed it, the lads were great. Um and we had a couple of conversations with them, but they, you know, they just weren't willing to take the risk. Which was again like so frustrating to me because I'm there, I'm training, I've been out for I've been out for seven months. And I remember the my first session. A couple of lads go, That's your first session back after an ACL. And I was like, Yeah, it's yeah. like seven and a half months. And you're like, What? Like, how's that? That's not normal. It's not possible. And I was like, No, look, I'm, I'm here, it clearly is. And um Obviously, like the, the the running and stuff, miles off it. Do you know what I mean? But like, and it, it that like proper hurt me. We did runs at the end of this session on day yeah. one. So day one, right after so seven and a half months after the ACL, I on my brother's life, right. 
I did the warm up and boxes, and the gaffer goes, Danny, we're doing a 10 v 10. Do you fancy it? And my whole body wanted to say no, but the kid in me, I just went, You go ahead, it's a game of footy. Like, I've not had one for seven months. Let's it's get close. me in. I did the 10 v 10 on three quarters of a pitch. My first day back after the ACL. And I remember right. texting me, me and my me, me, me mate who does SNC, Alan. Um, told him what I did, and he just put back like the, the hand emoji going, Please tell me you're okay, like, please, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Him. Like, what are you doing? Why did you agree to it? You're a lunatic, like, stop it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I uh, I did two solid weeks with them, and it was really good because their training schedule under Dino is really, really tough. Like, they're fit, they're a fit, they're a fit team, Burton. Uh, but that was perfect for me because I love their I'm always fit as a fiddle anyway, so mm-hmm. it was really good. I then come back. I went back to the rehab clinic that I was doing before I went into Burton for a couple of weeks. Yep. Cracked on with them until Roxdale come out. And Roxdale come out. End of November, I went in for a few days. And they were like, yeah, we definitely want to do something. So I was like, great buzzing. What can we do? They were like, we can only do a month. <laughs> I was like, not so great. Um, and we can only give you this amount of money. I was like, not so great again, but I've really got no choice. So let's that do it. It's either that or nothing, isn't it? So you're almost stuck a little bit, I suppose. I, as I say, I had no expectations about that. Like, it was literally just get your foot back in the door, Dan, and see where you're going. Yeah, of course. And then that, like, that, like Siberian weather front happened and no one played the game for two and a half, three weeks. And again, me and my missus, we just literally sat there like, I've got a month deal and two and a half weeks of it is frost. And she was just, we were just like, you were, you were like, you were a, you were like a warlock or something in your previous life. You were, you were a horrible person. Like, you've done despicable things because it just, it just, cannot happen again like another little mini setback after you get yeah. back get a club and two and a half of your first four weeks of your one month contract do you almost front. get to the point where you just not laugh it off because it's obviously massively frustrating but do, do you do you almost get used if you to don't it laugh, you'll be a blubbering cry, yeah. Yeah. crying on the floor and just you'll never recover like you've just got to so you just so- have to take the approach of you just yeah. right I'm going to prove I'm going to crack on a bit more and prove that I can do it yeah, you've literally just got to li- you've just got to roll with the punches, and you know if I was a boxer, I'd have been punch drunk years ago. But you, you just you just got to keep getting back up, and you know you, you're a long time. Someone said this to me, I can't remember who it was. It was you're a long time retired. You can't do this. You are for, forever. Yeah. So why stop when you're physically able? And I will play football to the frustration of my fiance until I am physically able like until I'm physically able my wife thing because this was exactly the same sort of thing I went through with her obviously it's a much lower level but like when I turned around in COVID and said I'm going to get a personal trainer I'm going to try again and I was bearing in mind I was 38 nearly 39 when I decided to do that and I got two and a half years out of it and my last game ended up my last game ended up being a cup final win so I you went out on a high mate with a bang but yeah but there's been no sort of People get going, you're missing it. And I'm like, nah, pre-season started last week and I'm absolutely yeah. fine. I went out for well, a I, like, Honestly, I'm a freak. <laughs> I love pre-season. I'm like a weirdo. I love pre-season. All the lads that I've ever played with hate me in pre-season. Yeah, that's because you're not a manager like I was. And I had to try and find 15, 16 players every summer. Yeah. And then you get 15 of them say they'll come training and four of them turn up. So, yeah. It's like... <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, you know, I've never, ever been one to shy away from a bit of graft, a bit of hard work. No, of you, you, got, you got to bite down, you got to bite down on your teeth Certainly. and just run through it. Like, that's just, that's just me in a nutshell. Like, over adapting to change, overcoming, you know, your setbacks and just mm-hmm. going and working hard and whatever else afterwards comes as a bonus. Like, I've literally just been doing me, I've done me away for B qualification, but mm-hmm. well, I'm still doing it. And I've been writing my, philosophy as a manager and my outlook is what how I want to be. Okay. I picked I picked five five like key pillars that I that I want to make me who I am as a manager and a coach and as a person. Mm-hmm. And hard work is in there and obviously the other stuff as well. But hard work for me or like just the attitude and the discipline to to, to get up every day and get into training on time do all your bits and be ready to train every day takes a incredible amount of mm-hmm. and determination and mental stability because at the end the environment of football is incredibly difficult. I, I've had a little three-year-old boy, love him to pieces. 
am I going to actively push him to become a professional footballer? No. No. Because <laughs> you know if I look at him and I see him that he's really good and I'm gonna be out in the garden with him every night trying to make him good and I'll 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 nudge him in the way he wants to go. But if he doesn't want to play football, I won't be pushing him into it because you have to be incredibly stable within your own mind to play football. In the, especially at all levels, you know, look at Deli Ali's interview the other day. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, that was, that was hard to heartbreaking. watch. Heartbreaking. Yeah. And, like, people don't know the struggle that you have in your own mind. People can look at someone. People can look at someone and on the surface, they would, like, look at and go, he's absolutely no problem. Like, all these people in, in the gym where I was going to train, they probably looked at me and going, He's flying in, like, and mm. honestly, in on the inside, there was times when I was going that same day in day out on the inside, I was just like a mess, like, uh, uh, like broken. Mm-hmm. And I think that's, I think I put a video out saying like it's the toughest week of me, <laughs> like it's the toughest week of the rehab. But in in reality, it was one of the toughest weeks of my life because it, it I, I was like, I think it was like. 17 weeks in or something it was. It was just like, I was just broken physically, mentally, just stick with worry about what I'm going to be able to provide for my family. I just started running. It felt horrific, as you well know. When you first start trying to run again after your knee, it's yeah. horrible. It just doesn't feel like your own leg. It And, you know, it gets better and whatever, and, you know. It does, yeah, you're right. I remember a couple of games back, and it's almost like, you, almost like you're having to carry it independently that was what it felt like to me like like someone had given you either two left feet or someone else or a bag of cement that's what it felt like mate, that'd be great that'd be great if i could have two left feet mate <laughs> what the standing on <laughs> well yeah so then no, that, no, i do appreciate you obviously going into the details because again it's 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 something that that i think gets sort of forgotten amongst football yeah. fans certainly is and that's that's the mental side of the game and the mental battle that we all have to go through at, like you said at, at whatever level whether that's me as a Sunday league player, you as a hopefully an EFL player again soon. Yeah. Or like you just alluded to, Deli Ali right at the top of the game, one of England's best generational talents five, six years ago. And now look at the, the difference and let's hope that he can get back to where he should be. Yeah. Um just quickly before we wrap this up, you've already mentioned that people sort of thought you were some sort of freak of nature in terms of how quick you got back. Yeah. And the numbers that you were putting out as well, because Rochdale, you was there for four months. Yeah, from but really, realistically, you've got to write off the face. Like, you, listen, Pete. Like, look at look at Andros Sanza now. Andros Sanza the nightmare with his knee. He got mm-hmm. injured after me, and he's still not back. Mm-hmm. Not kicked the ball. So people say like you could like you you could write off the first six months when you get back, but I knew I couldn't afford to do that. So well, I, I Andros again, off. not being horrible, Andros can afford to do that because of the contracts he's yeah, had throughout his career. Sam, yeah, I, I um I wrote off the first like five six games. When I look back, I wrote off the, I write off them because I was literally trying to get back to match fitness after a big big injury. Mm-hmm. But from I'd say maybe mid January onwards, end of January onwards, when I really started to get match fit and I could feel myself having more of an influence mm-hmm. and more of a contribution on the games whatever game however many games into Rochdale Newport at home was whether you've got that there I can have a quick look two seconds it was Newport at home it was the first game I felt like I'm back and I'm the version of myself that I was potentially before I got injured like near enough there I had a really solid game Newport was games. game that was game four yeah so you write off the first few mm-hmm. and then I had like an, I, I was having like I started to get like like a good spells like that was my first like I think 50 55 60 minutes where I was like on it and I had a good effect on the game and then you know it was a couple of assists and I think I scored my first goal back away at Orient, but like could have had another. We got beat 2 1, I think it was. We could have nicked the draw. Mm-hmm. I, I, and again, Rochdale frustrating season in terms of like the collective. We, 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 were, we never got battered by anyone. 
set you were always winner, losing by one set, goal. Set out the winner away at Bradford, which weren't helping us at the time. Yeah, yeah, that was again, again, but that was like you know, a, like I'd, I'd say a typical Danny Lloyd phase of play inside the game, flip it outside, running behind, cross yeah. goal, like dynamic, aggressive, like, and you know, where I am now. Obviously, I've missed a few weeks of pre-season, but I'm still looking at like the numbers that I'm putting in running wise. And I know I could go into the majority of League One and League Two squads and all of their running tests that they want to test their squad in. I would, if I am not in the top three, right out there. I would be very disappointed with my own training in this past few weeks. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the the ball work and the team stuff, you're not going to be where you need to be. But I still go in and I feel like I'd hold my own at most clubs. Um, but just literally, you know waiting around for the right option. You know, I feel like I come off the back of a really, really solid half a season. I think I had six goals and three or four assists, maybe like 10 goals. Six goals was... and three assists I've written down and them six yeah. goals came in your final 15 games. So you was going along at just over one in two, which is for yeah. a midfielder is very, very good. And again, a midfielder that's coming off the back of said what was potentially a career-ending injury just a year before yeah. is, is, is staggering and it's a yeah. fair play to you. Fair play to you indeed. That assist as well. I'm out of Bradford. They actually didn't get the assist for that. So that's why I'm saying four. Didn't actually go down as mine because they touched the keeper on the way across. Wow, that's ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. Yeah, so I'll give, anyway, give it to you in Fantasy Premier League. Yeah, uh, give it a fantasy. <laughs> so it's ten, it's ten, I'm claiming 10. Um, but yeah, you know, it was frustrating. But what, what a lovely football club that is. Some really nice people behind the scenes that love the club. And I was devastated for the club when the eventuality happened because you know it was a long time coming we nearly performed a little bit of a you know last stand type of thing it was almost it was it, to me there was some similarities to Jill's the season before yeah. or I was in a different division but yeah but again it ultimately came down to they just left themselves too much to do and and that yeah. type of thing and you know key people missing at key times and that type of thing is it, it catches up with you but yeah they're a proper football club and I think it's a real shame that they dropped in a non-league because yeah. that national league's an arsehole to get out of now as well that's a tough tough I know and, yes. I mean, not Wrexham and Notts County have come up into, into League Two and that's going to be a tough test for, for Jules and everyone else next season. But there's still some big teams that are going to really fancy it in the National League yeah. next term. So, yeah, Rochdale, I think, have, have probably got a bit of work to do to certainly come back up at the first time of asking. Um, mm-hmm. But, yeah, it would be great if they did. The future, you just mentioned you're looking, you're waiting, sitting, waiting for the phone to ring for the right option. Um the beauty just waiting patiently, mate. Just waiting patiently for uh, you know, something to to come. We've had you know a reasonable amount of interest. I would say we've had a good amount of interest from some really good clubs, um, throughout the window. Just um, not been able to get one over the line just yet for a multitude of reasons. Um, you, you know, you 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 talk about a football deal and it's not straightforward. You've got to piece together the club, the formation you play, how interested the ad, what the offer. So like some people might say, oh yeah, we love him, we really like him. And then the, the offer doesn't reflect that. Mm-hmm. Like, well, it's, you know, might have to move away. How does it work? Um, What's the logistical side of me moving away? Can I do it hybrid where I'm away a couple of nights a week and then I get to come home? Is it too mm-hmm. far to do that? Do I need to actually fully commit to moving away again? Do I move the family? You've got so many things to, to consider. And then when you work out what the offer is on top, like, and, you can work. Is it co- is it cost effective yeah. to be able to do is all of them things? To do it. Um, so you know, as sit as 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 it's not nice to be still sat here now, considering how well I feel I performed at the back end of last season mm-hmm. uh, for Rochdale in a team that ultimately gets relegated. Um, again, you know, I really do hope that they stabilise the club, and I feel like in notes the club have got a good young manager who is very set in his ways about how he wants to play the game. It'll be an attacking style of football, which I really enjoyed playing in those last like eight games. Because before that, I was playing central midfield in a, in the three, it was funny enough, in a three, five, two, I was playing in centre mid as, as one of the two forward eight slash tens, um, which I was told I could never ever do and played really well. I got goal of the season at home to Swindon and I was playing in, Centre yeah, midfield. Yeah, yeah it was a good one. I won for the that one, yeah. <laughs> it was all right, that one. Um, but that comes to me playing in centre mid. And I enjoyed that 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 like centre midfield role because you get on the ball and you look up and everything's in front of you. You can pick passes, you can make runs, 
you can cross from deep, you can have long range shots, which I've always liked to do in my career anyway. Um, so I feel like that added another string to my bow as I do, you know, get a bit older. I've got another position that I can now play. Um, mm-hmm. And yeah, just ultimately really sad for the club to go down. And then obviously, you know, when we tried to negotiate in the summer, uh, the sort of, you know, they said they were going to offer me a deal. However, you know, restrictions were going to be coach. placed on the deal after the relegation. Um, and without going into too much detail of the offer that they put over, it there was just no feasible or logical way for me to accept that offer um, as much as I would have loved to. Because I, as I say, I feel like the club is in great hands in nuts as a manager. Um, he's going to be a good young manager. I say he's got a really definitive way he wants to play and how he sees the game. Uh, and I just really hope that he can stabilise the team for the start of this National League campaign. Um, and I wish him, the lads, the club, nothing but the best for the future. Um, and obviously, you know, the same for Jills this season. Um, you know, yeah, I, I can't I can't say anything more than that other than just, you know, I really hope that you go and mount a, a proper, proper promotion challenge this year. And uh, I feel like he's a, you know, Neil's put a decent squad together. Uh for the level, you signed some really, really good players. Mm-hmm. I think he's will be incredibly solid. And probably if I was a better man, I would probably put you guys to have the best defence in the league this year. It's funny you should say that because I said that to someone on WhatsApp today. I said, I, am I getting ahead of myself, especially with the addition of Scott Malone yeah. today, I, as, as we're recording? I think we've probably got collectively, if not the best, probably to, certainly top five, top three defensive units in the division. When you look I at position he's a, for position. He's a versatile, you can play a four, you can play a three. If you've got a three of Masterson, right Aimer, Masterson, right Ogie, yeah. solid. And then you've got your wing backs. Uh, you've obviously got that Malone. I think you've got the lad Alexander out plays on the right. Got Max Clark, who got promoted with Steve in his last yeah. season at left so, back with Robbie McKenzie. There's loads of options. You know what I mean? You've got Robbie Mack, mate, honest to God. Swiss, Swiss Army knife, Robbie Mack can do absolutely oh, anything. Plays can play here. anywhere, yeah. Got lower league, Jamie back. Carragher. Yeah, he's an incredible footballer, Robbie Mack, and an incredible lad as well. You know, I enjoy spending time with him, enjoy playing golf with him as well. He's a good golfer as well. Um, but yeah, no, I, uh, I, I can wish the jail's not on but the best for the future. Um, as much well, as, you know... You mentioned it just at the beginning, and I have to ask, because a few, obviously, I put the tweet out to say that, that Danny Lloyd was coming on to talk and a lot of people, yeah. and then because I was part of a kit reveal the other week and Johnny Williams was there, people are like, ah, oh, Matt's now announcing Danny Lloyd has decided. I'm not. I told <laughs> yeah. people I'm not, unfortunately. Fortunately not, no, unfortunately. Um, but you've mentioned, because a lot of people have said to me, oh, Danny Lloyd would never come back to Gillingham because of geography. And we've spoken a few times. So I just want you to not put the record straight, but geography doesn't come into it. You've mentioned if you get the right club and the right move, you'd move your family. If, you know, obviously after discussions, not just you're going to tell them. Oh, yeah. No, listen, it, it obviously be after the discussions. We've uh, we've we've done the With whole... The boss, you know, of course. I, I disappear and then ring the phone and say, oh, I've just signed here and this is where I'm going. And of course. Going. Uh, we've done that but geography is not one of the biggest factors that would determine where you go and play your football. Not necessarily, no, because my fiancé is... I couldn't ask for a more supportive foundation and background. Mm-hmm. I really, Honestly, I really couldn't. Um, so... And I've just scored loads of brownie points there for when she does eventually watch this. So, um, yeah, I could, honestly, I couldn't, I, could, I couldn't ask for a more solid foundation and more supportive partner. I really couldn't. Um, she said to me, you can go wherever you want. And if it's feasible for us to go with you, great. If not, we will make it work. So, and, you know, I wouldn't have went to Gillingham in the first place. Um, if it wasn't, you know, if the location was an issue, Gillingham, weirdly, as far as it is away, because it's ridiculously far away from where I live, because I don't live in Liverpool. I'm from Liverpool, born and bred, but I live like 35 minutes north, not far from Southport. Like, right, okay. I was talking about the Open, just been on, but I had to literally live, don't live too far from Royal Birkdale, the golf course. So it's, yep. that, it's an extra 40 minutes north of Liverpool. Okay. So it's far. Yeah, however, it however, it's incredibly well connected by train. Yeah, that's it. That is one of the big advantages, yeah. So for me to get home 
I could turn it round there and back in 24 hours. <laughs> and, you know, if there, I, there, was a, there was a way I could leave my house and get to Gillingham for half nine or 10 o'clock or something for training. And then Neil used to, I think it was either Neil or Steve used to like a later start on a Monday. So if I'd gone home on a Saturday after the game, you could stay I knew I could get back. I could stay Saturday night, Sunday night, and then get the, the earliest train. I think it's like five past six out of Lime Street. Get you into Houston, walk around St. Pancras, HS1, Lime Street, to Gillingham, 35 minutes. Done. Like, and as, you know, it was, and as I said, I've said easier uh, earlier, I enjoyed my life down there. I hated being away from my family and my son. It was hard, but I know I've got. I knew I had the support. I knew I had the support to go and and you know I feel like that was reflected in me performances on the pitch. I feel like I played well for the Jills when I was there because I was settled. Um, I think if we were to come down, if I was to re-sign for Jills ever in the future, which probably won't happen because you know you've got your own journey to go on now. Mm-hmm. Um, I would move the family down. I would have liked to have moved them down if the the the, the option was there, just so again you'd be even more further settled. Um, oh, because you know Kent is a lovely part of the world. There's some lovely parts of Kent that I really oh. enjoyed spending time in. Um, and I say I feel like all of that culminated into me putting some good performances and on the pitch. Unfortunately, you know it ended in disaster for me personally and for the club. Uh, oh. But I feel like you guys are on a very much upward trajectory now that I don't think is going to stop. Um, for hopefully for you guys for a decent number of years, I hope uh, Brad uh, does really well for the club. I feel like he's got the right ideas and the right mm-hmm. people below him to 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 make his vision a, a reality. And again, you know, I can't stress it enough. I wish the club nothing but the best for the future. Um, and you know, Neil and the lads hope they are going. You know, do the business this year. Obviously, if I end up signing for a League 2 club, not against whoever I play against, but whoever yeah, I play. I like you shit twice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was shite when we played for when we played Gillingham at all. I didn't want to bring it up, but I was... Yeah, was, we were yeah, I remember I watched that game. I think that was one of the ones that was on iPhone, I think, because it was... Yeah, a, we were very good that day. Weekend, yeah. You just didn't, just, you just, you just, you just didn't sit. I did, don't think you just didn't get enough of the ball, unfortunately. And, and you need to have the ball to have an impact on football matches. That's, yeah. that's, how, that's how you play the game. So Yeah. But yeah, I wasn't too disappointed that you were rubbish. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Dan, it's been a real pleasure. Honestly, I really Always. appreciate you taking the time Always. out because Always. it's there's been some really interesting stories in there and I hope that you do get a club sooner rather than later because you certainly deserve yeah. it and hopefully that there, there's not too many more setbacks um, regarding injuries or just anything else that tends to go wrong. Um, no, mate, there's going to be lows, don't worry. There's going to be but you, um, you seem to have the right approach and you just get up and you keep keep moving forward and keep pushing on and that's yeah. got to be the right approach to it because like you say it's it's a short career it's a longer retirement they yeah. have to enjoy it while it's there um jill's fans please go and show some love to danny on instagram and twitter i will put his details in the description at the bottom i'm sure you're all following him anyway you can follow his journey in terms of his continued pre-season on his own which is lonely and his continued search for a new club and obviously that will then lead to you seeing when he does get a new football team to play for for the 23-24 campaign I appreciate you watching I appreciate you retweeting please keep doing that as you always do because like I say all the time this channel is nothing without you guys supporting it we'll be back later in the week for another Jules in the Blood Chats too again I'm not going to tell you who it is um, and it's not too far away now is it Stockport on the 5th of August it will soon come flying around You can pop around Danny's and have a cup of tea if you want. Until next time, up the jewels.